We often forget the collateral consequences of this on surviving family members. A bill signed into law this week aiming to help the families of crime victims. It was another nice spring day, but changes are coming. How a cold front this weekend could impact your plans. A popular South Valley summer spot is putting a price on parking. The new changes coming to Black Ridge Reservoir. A woman is dead and somehow another woman survived after a home explosion in American Fork. That's a little bit of a miracle in my mind. Hear from neighbors and what happened just one day earlier. Managing the mighty Colorado River, the states that have a say, the disagreements, and how all of it will impact your life. Live from Utah's news leader, Fox 13 News at 9 starts right now. Hello, everyone. I'm Kelly Chapman. And I'm Bob Evans. Families of crime victims will get a little more help thanks to a new Utah law that was signed by Governor Spencer Cox earlier this week. As Fox 13 News reporter Chris Arnold shows us, it's being applauded by both the Salt Lake County District Attorney and those who work directly with the families of murder victims. In the six years, we've probably helped over 200 families. Brandon Merrill is the executive director and founder of Utah Homicide Survivors. A lot of different cases, probably four to 500 cases. Seeing firsthand the impact crime can have on families and even his own. My cousin's children have been affected by losing their father um, through that road rage incident that occurred a yeah. year and a half ago. House Bill 218, signed into law on Monday by Governor Spencer Cox, is making revisions to restitution for the families of crime victims. Well, the bill basically says that if somebody in the commission of a crime, including uh, driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs, uh, kills or permanently disables uh, a parent or guardian of a minor child, meaning under the age of 18, is part of the, the criminal sentence, they can be ordered to uh, restitution. Something Representative Steve Ellison, the bill sponsors, says is similar to child support and would have to be paid until that child turns 18 years old. It's all crimes. So if they're convicted of murder, then this will be an automatic part of the sentence. This is a bill that is going to be uh, very impactful in the criminal justice system. Salt Lake County District Attorney Sim Gill says his office worked closely with Representative Ellison on this legislation. What this bill really says is that if you're going to engage in criminal conduct and you're going to leave those children without a parent or with the ability to financially be able to take care of themselves, that you're going to be held responsible and accountable for that. So it not only expresses the value of justice, but it actually delivers on that as well. While this bill won't be able to help his family directly with it just being signed into law, Merrill is optimistic about how it will benefit the families he serves moving forward. It's going to really help focus, again, putting the cost of the, the crime back on the perpetrator. Well, Representative Ellison tells me that he expects this law to go into effect on May 1st. On the Hill, Chris Arnold, Fox 13 News, Utah. Now to our other top story. It has been 15 hours now since one woman was killed and another emerged unharmed from a house explosion in American Fork. It happened just before 6 a.m. Neighbors woke up to a big boom, that one right there, and debris flying through the air. Some of, the, uh, some of it landed almost a half mile away. Fire crews from all over the county came to help at the senior living community near 300 East Main Street. The identity of the woman who died has yet to be released. Fox 13 News reporter Emily Tenser will have a full report on what happened today and what led up to the explosion coming up in the next half hour. Police in Brigham City say their investigation into the death of 61-year-old Fanny Escalona D'Angelo is ongoing, but they do want to clarify they do not suspect foul play at this time. This, despite the affidavit for a search warrant stating the case, is being investigated as a possible homicide. The document says she was found with a ligature tied in a knot around her neck. Fanny was found unresponsive in Big Cottonwood Creek three weeks ago. A missing person report was made the morning before. 
We're learning more about that assault at a downtown Salt Lake City funeral home yesterday afternoon. Six men were injured, several had stab wounds. Detectives believe several dozen people gathered for a viewing when a fight broke out. Investigators are trying to determine a motive. Police say the injured men's ages range from 17 to 35. Their names have not been released. No arrests have been made. If you have any information that can help the investigation, call Salt Lake Police. Today, a federal court rejected efforts to block implementation of the Bureau of Land Management's plan to outlaw motor vehicles in the greater Labyrinth Canyon area. The BLM closed the trails to motor vehicles in the Gemini Bridges area just northwest of Moab last fall. The plaintiffs want the trails reopened immediately, worrying they will be gone soon without vehicle traffic. The Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance is pleased with the court's decision to allow the BLM's plan to go forward, calling it a balanced approach to managing recreation in the area. The full case will now be heard later this year. A popular South Salt Lake Valley summer spot is putting a price on parking. Fox 13 News reporter Jenna Bree shows us the changes coming to Black Ridge Reservoir. What was once a gem enjoyed by neighbors has become a popular overcrowded destination. People came by the swarms from out far away and they were not respectful, clutter everywhere, and it was really hard to get to your house. They would park even smack in front of your driveway. It was really a, a terrible experience. Harriman residents have grown frustrated with people abusing Black Ridge Reservoir. Our house is in the no permitted zone or whatever. Uh, but we still have people knock on our door all the time asking if they could park in our driveway. The city recently announced on weekends and holidays, people will have to pay $15 to park in the lot. Some of them are nuisances, some of them are vandalism even. Um, so the city has looked at measures for a long time to try to reduce overcrowding, allow people to still come here and enjoy the amenity, enjoy the reservoir and still try to, to thin out the crowds a bit. To discourage people from illegally parking on residential streets, the city is increasing fines from $25 to a minimum of $100. The primary driver behind this decision was to reduce peak time crowds. It is not a money grab or some way to increase revenue or to, to fill the city's pockets. It's not going to do that. The main intent is to help deter people from coming during the weekends and holidays when overcrowding is the biggest problem now. Stuart Hutchison is skeptical that people will actually obey the rules. I think it's the step in the right direction. Um, as long as they enforce it, right? Um, I, they can have these rules and, and have a parking fee, but what's going to happen is people won't want to park here because there's a parking fee, so they'll go park everywhere else in the neighborhood. Although she's supportive of thinning crowds, Joanne Leibel says Harriman residents should be allowed to park for free. The people that didn't live in Harriman are the ones that came here and abused it. And those that lived in Harriman uh, loved it and kept it clean. I think that is unfair. I think if you live, I think if you live here, that you should be able to park here for free. The new parking changes go into effect on May 1st. In Harriman, Jenna Bree, Fox 13 News, Utah. What an absolutely gorgeous day oh, today. Yeah. I Not mean, a cloud in the yeah, sky. Bluebird like. skies and the All temperature right. was just right on point. Yes. Yeah. Please, can we keep doing this? <laughs> well, we'll do more of this probably in early May because that's what today was like. Upper 60s here in Salt Lake, our hottest day so far this year. And our temp that we saw today is more typical for early May. So we got oiled today. Uh, we're a bit ahead, ahead of schedule by uh, quite a bit. We've got temps today that made it to the 70s for St. George and then right now it's still in the upper 50s for Salt Lake City. 58 currently for Ogden, 53 for Provo. Tomorrow we'll shave just a few degrees off of the daytime high, but we'll still take you into the 60s tomorrow. High pressure eventually moves out and that's going to make way for our next storm moving in from the northwest. We are going to see some pretty big changes, especially towards the middle of this upcoming weekend. For tonight, we've had a few clouds across southern Utah, across the state, though most of us under clear sky. Some clouds are 
starting to move into Nevada. We'll see those arriving into tomorrow morning and for Salt Lake City into the overnight hours. Temps will drop only into the mid 40s, so really not too bad as you wake up tomorrow morning. We do, though, have some big changes on the way for this weekend. We'll have more on that coming up in just a bit. Coming up, it's been nearly six years since the death of Lauren McCluskey at the University of Utah. So where is the U now with campus safety? I'm in it to win it, and I want to make sure that, you know, I can get the support of the community. Plus, a big name in Utah's black community is running for office. We talked to Jeanetta Williams with the NAACP as she kicks off her campaign for the Utah House. I'm just happy that I get to be here and happy that I get to you know, play with my brothers right here where I'm from. And there's a local name playing in the NCAA men's basketball tournament. Hear from Samford guard Rylan Jones as he returns home to Utah to play against the Kansas Jayhawks. It has been about five and a half years since Lauren McCluskey was shot to death on campus at the University of Utah by an ex-boyfriend. He was not a student and had followed her to her dorm. Since then, several members of the campus police department have left, left the department. There is new leadership along with a brand new public safety building. Today they held a safety summit aiming to make the campus safer for everyone. I'll just say that uh... You know, we have a great group here, a collection of uh, individuals uh, with uh, different backgrounds, um, but uh, subject matter experts, and the presentations have been outstanding, so we're very fortunate. Some of the panel discussions uh, are hitting topics that are very timely, such as First Amendment protected activity and how to handle that. University of Utah policy says students and visitors are allowed to bring a weapon to campus as long as they have a concealed carry permit. In election news, Salt Lake NAACP President Janetta Williams has launched her campaign for Utah House District Seat 26. District 26 was recently redistricted back in 2023 to the current boundaries you see right there on your screen. Williams says her priorities are diversity, education, housing, and mental health. I'm in it to win it, and I want to make sure that, you know, I can get the support of the community because uh, I have the name recognition, and people know me, and they know what I stand for. She is going up against this man, Republican incumbent Matt McPherson. McPherson was appointed by a Utah Republican delegation after a special election in October of last year, after Representative Quinn Cotter resigned last September, citing stress and health concerns. Now, if you're curious, Janetta Williams, if she wins, will not have to leave her post as the president of the NAACP, as Utah has a part-time legislature, meaning all members are allowed to have day jobs, including incumbent McPherson, who is a self-described businessman. Okay, I hope you have filled out your bracket, Bob, because the NCAA tournament gets underway tomorrow including four games being played right here in Salt Lake City. It is really exciting, Kel. For one player in particular, it's an opportunity to actually return home. Fox 13 sports reporter Morgan Vance shares the story of college basketball journeyman Ryland Jones. Coming full circle is more than just a cliche for Ryland Jones. It's point blank his story, one that has a chance for a Cinderella ending. From Olympus Green to Ute Red to Aggie Blue. After persevering through a concussion that sidelined him most of last season, Ryland decided it was finally time to leave Utah for his final year of eligibility. I knew I was playing basketball again, you know, after being cleared by multiple neuro neurologists and uh, doctors. I'm just happy that Sanford came calling. An 1,800-mile trip south to Birmingham, Alabama, where he ran point for the Bulldogs, leading Sanford to a 29-5 season. You know, we got him late May 30th, I believe. Had him on a visit, talked to him coming on the red-off flight. Him and Jonesy, his dad, and so glad we got him. And after winning the Southern Conference Tournament, Ryland knew he and his guys were off to one of eight potential locations. And they will face Samford, who is in for the first time since 2000. And get ready, Kansas. You know, seeing your name pop up on Selection Sunday is one of the coolest feelings you can feel, I think. And then an added bonus was it was in Salt Lake City, and I get to come home and see all my, you know, family and friends. I know it wasn't the best destination for my boys right here, but... Uh, 
I was happy to see it. Jones was a part of last year's Utah State squad that fell at the dance to Missouri in round one, but this time will be healthy enough to play and in front of an entire support system that didn't even have to book a flight to see it. Obviously, it saved a lot of money, but uh, not just my you know close family get to come watch me and play again in person, but all my Olympus family, my Logan High family, you know, whole Utah community that I grew up in here for 22 years. But to continue that run beyond tomorrow night, they'll have to shock a juggernaut that has been to 16 Final Fours and won four national titles. Ryland drawing inspiration from another Utah son. I was usually cheering against him, but I loved watching him play. And, you know, Jimmer Mania that year, he had an unbelievable run. It's just dream come true, you know, you see your name playing in the NCAA tournament. From the Delta Center, Morgan Vance, Fox 13 Sports. Well, we'll have some gorgeous weather here in Salt Lake tomorrow for anybody who's downtown visiting 57 currently here in Salt Lake. I do want to mention there are some parts of the country that are really cold. Look at this Minneapolis 28 30 for Chicago 38 for New York Salt Lake. That's the place to be upper 60s today. Not too far off of a record 75 degrees set back in 2017 for the rest of tonight. Clear and mild. Nice morning tomorrow. Temperatures in the mid 40s as you wake up. Partly cloudy tomorrow as a weak cold front moves through, but generally speaking, we're going to have a beautiful day tomorrow. Temperatures will be just a tiny bit cooler than today. Thanks to tomorrow's weak cold front with a much stronger cold front on the way heading into Saturday afternoon. Before that, some isolated showers are possible as we wrap up the week, but things are really going to get going. Second half of the day, Saturday, valley rain, mountain snowfall, snow levels starting at about 7,000 feet, eventually dropping to 5,000 feet and perhaps even down to the valley floors by Sunday morning or on and off rain and snow levels rising and falling, ebbing and flowing into the early to middle part of next week. So a wintry mix is possible basically starting Saturday night into the middle of next week. Salt Lake that 57 degrees right now, 58 for Ogden, 53 degrees currently for Provo. As we look here across the state, we're under mostly clear sky right now, but additional clouds will start to move through tonight into tomorrow morning. As we look at future cast, those clouds moving into Nevada. Those will be arriving tomorrow early in the day. Chance for some isolated sprinkles, nothing too impactful. And then as we look at the forecast, we're going to have temperatures in the 30s and 40s tomorrow morning for Salt Lake. Another nice spring day with above average temperatures into the 60s, but we'll have more clouds tomorrow and then heading into St. George. You also have some additional clouds tomorrow, but still a nice day, partly cloudy mid 70s at 4 p.m. So by tomorrow at 4 o'clock here across the state, we've got those temps right around 60 to 65 degrees for Almost all of you, even up in Park City, close to 50 tomorrow, near 60 for the Cache Valley, low 60s for the Uinta Basin and Price, 67 degrees down in Kanab. Then we're going to see some changes this weekend. St. George breezy on Saturday with widely scattered rain late in the day, 58 on Sunday, still a chance for some rain, but lower chances than us here up north. For Salt Lake, 60s through early Saturday until our cold front arrives. 50 on Sunday, as I mentioned, a wintry mix starting Saturday evening. We'll have more on that coming up in just a bit. Allison, thanks so much. Coming up, we'll show you a first of its kind health clinic that just opened at Salt Lake City's West High School. The Jazz battle the Thunder tonight as they start a three game road trip. It's a battle between teams going in opposite directions. Which team will come out on top tonight? We'll tell you coming up. A first of its kind health school, high school health clinic just opened at West High School in Salt Lake City. Fox 13 News reporter Lucy Nelson shows us how it hopes to address accessibility issues when it comes to students seeking mental and physical health care. This is huge for our school and hopefully this will be the start for other health clinics and other schools. A new way for students to get health care right outside their classrooms. A lot of students who have issues with transportation or certain financial issues, this is just a really easy way for students here to get that help. West High student body president Derek Wilhelm says he has seen firsthand the health care needs of his fellow peers. A lot of my friends might struggle with a mental illness and addiction and stress and depression and of course, you know, physical illness or injuries that may happen. West High School Clinic Medical Director Christina Thewitt says the new clinic can take up to 50 patients per day in psychology, psychiatry and primary care. 
offering anything from a quick sports physical to an in-depth therapy session. And we also have an addiction specialist who comes as well. So for students who may need help with substance use or vaping or nicotine or alcohol use, we have those services here too. She says the clinic isn't just convenient for the students themselves, it also helps their families. But it actually eliminates a lot of barriers to care, such as if a family doesn't have a car or a reliable transportation, or if parents are working one or two jobs, or they have other children at home that they're caring for, taking their child out of school to another health care facility can be something that they can't do. The clinic hopes to serve more than 7,000 students from throughout the district who will have access to the clinic through interschool busing. In Salt Lake City, Lucy Nelson, Fox 13 News, Utah. My wife said, what was that? And I said, it wasn't good. I honestly do not know how anyone survived what we are seeing here. A fatal home explosion. I spoke to the family of the survivor. The bargaining has just begun over the Colorado River. It's a big deal and it's going to impact your life. How a new program launching here at Weber State University is aimed at helping Spanish speaking students, but also improving the state's workforce. The big dance is here for BYU. We'll check in with the Cougars in Omaha as they get ready for their first round game tomorrow. dead and another miraculously survived after a home explosion in American Fork Wednesday morning. I'm Emily Tenser with Fox 13 News Utah. Fire crews say debris went flying almost half a mile away. It was just like any Wednesday morning until a big boom setting off car alarms and prompting neighbors to run out on their sidewalks. From across the American Fork neighborhood, homeowners watched as flames and smoke billowed into the sky. The sound of sirens told them help was on the way. We both popped up in bed. My wife said, what was that? And I said, it wasn't good. Neighbor Jim Hopkinson found the woman who lives there standing in the cul-de-sac. Over and over, she was saying, my house blew up. <laughs> my house blew up. She survived the side of the duplex that exploded. The woman who lived in the other half did not. I honestly do not know how anyone survived what we are seeing here. That's a little bit of a miracle in my mind. I, I don't understand how anyone survived this. According to the survivor's granddaughter, Dominion Energy crews were at the home the day before the explosion. Her family says they were there to fix a part of the gas meter that had eroded because of age. Dominion Energy says they were in the area completing routine maintenance. A spokesperson says they're gathering information and that the company is deeply saddened at the tragic loss of life. We've had Dominion on site. They're, they've checked all the homes in the immediate area to make sure that everything is safe and they have deemed there is not an issue. American Fork Fire Rescue Battalion Chief Brandon Beauchard doesn't know how long it'll take to find the cause. Neighbors hope they'll find the answer soon. I'm grateful for safety. Sorry that we had a that we lost a neighbor. And uh, just hope I can be of some help. Hopkinson has been helpful. We interviewed him around 11 a.m. and he already had over 8,000 steps just from walking around the neighborhood, checking to make sure everybody was okay. Building officials with the city of American Fork also checked every house near the explosion site. This one right next door was the only one deemed uninhabitable. Reporting in American Fork, Emily Tenser, Fox 13 News, Utah. Cash County Clerk and Auditor David Benson has resigned from office. A review of Cash County's 2023 general municipal election found, quote, deeply troubling findings and observations by the Utah Lieutenant Governor's Office. In the wake of Benson's resignation, County Executive David Zook issued this statement. He said, I call upon our public and especially other elected officials to diligently strive for unity and cooperation that we might better serve our citizens. We have new details in the death of 21 year old Alex Franco. He was allegedly abducted from a Taylorsville neighborhood, fatally shot and his body found in a remote area of Utah County yesterday. Fox 13 News reporter Darian DeBrule listened to today's detention hearing for the two juvenile suspects now in custody. 
This started over the weekend when police released information regarding what they believed was an abduction. Sadly, on Tuesday, officers said Alex Franco, the person they believed to have been abducted, was found dead, and they arrested a 15 and 17 year old. The teens are minors and charges are pending, so we are not naming them. Wednesday morning, the teens appeared before a judge in a detention hearing. She read statements made by law enforcement. The judge said on March 17, three juveniles arrived in Taylorsville, Utah to sell a gun to the victim. The judge said, quote, the victim got into the vehicle the 17 year old was driving to discuss the sale of the firearm. An argument ensued and the 17 year old drove away from the area with the victim being held against their will. The statements go on to say the 15 year old later told his girlfriend he shot and killed the victim with a nine millimeter handgun in the car and that they drove the victim to Utah County and left his body. The judge reading from police statements said the 17 year old admitted he was driving the vehicle and the victim was held against their will. And although being present during the homicide, the 15 year old claimed he did not shoot anyone. As of today, the teens have not been charged, but I spoke with Mark Moffitt, a local criminal defense lawyer who says Utah law has different provisions for teens who are 16 or 17 and those who are 14 or 15 when it comes to being charged as adults. He says when the suspect is 14 or 15, prosecution first has to file criminal information in juvenile court. Once they file the criminal information in the juvenile court in cases involving aggravated murder or murder, it's a signal to the defendant that they intend to try that individual as an adult. But unlike the direct file statute that allows them to file directly in the adult system, they have to have proceedings in the juvenile court. The prosecution has a duty to establish by probable cause that the juvenile committed the crimes charged. Now, if they're able to then meet that threshold, then they have to show by a preponderance of the evidence that the individual should be tried in the adult system. Moffitt goes on to say the courts will also look at other factors like the nature of the offense, the juvenile's role in the offense, and their background or history when it comes to determining if a juvenile will be charged as an adult. The two teens are being held in detention and both have court hearings scheduled for March 27th. We'll continue working to get as much information as possible on this case. In studio, Darian DeBrule, Fox 13 News, Utah. Still to come, we'll look at negotiations underway over water rights on the Colorado River. And coming up, temperatures tomorrow still in the 60s. Today we made it to 68, our hottest day so far this year. We do have a strong cold front on the way this weekend. How that could impact your plans coming up. Welcome back, everyone. More bills from the recent legislative session were signed into law tonight. Now, if you're keeping score, the governor has signed 503 of the 531 that were passed by the legislature. Here are the big ones in the latest batch. Vape juice flavors are banned, except menthol and tobacco. Ohm's Law, named for a child who died in a murder-suicide, will rework how child custody evaluations are, and agreements are carried out. Student teachers who work to earn their certification will get money for it, where they previously worked for free. Townships such as Magna and Copperton will now become cities. And state lawmakers will commission a study to look at budget issues surrounding Medicaid. A bill that blocks efforts to grant legal personhood status to natural bodies such as the Great Salt Lake is now law. The Ten Commandments may be discussed in school classes alongside historic documents such as the Magna Carta. Cosmetic surgery consultations can be done over telemedicine. Eyelash and eyebrow technicians will be regulated, but public cold baths won't be regulated at such high levels so long as safety standards are met. With the potential for yet another government shutdown, Utah Congressman John Curtis says he and his colleagues should not get paid for it. On the social media platform Threads, Utah's third district congressman posted this video. He has repeatedly tried to introduce a bill saying members of Congress should not be paid if the government shuts down. Of course, the bill has gone nowhere. By the way, Curtis is running for Senate. He is one of the many Republican candidates seeking to replace retiring Utah Senator Mitt Romney. It's going to have tremendous, tremendous effect. High stakes negotiations will begin over the future of the Colorado River. 
there are things that, that we can agree to. I'm Ben Winslow in St. George. The Colorado River impacts two countries, seven states, and 40 million people who live in them. An agreement has to be reached by 2026, and the bargaining has just begun. We've reached out to the lower division states and anticipate that we'll start meeting with them within the next week or two. At a meeting of the Utah Water Users Association, a group of water districts, irrigation companies, and other stakeholders, the Colorado River Authority of Utah updated us on the state of negotiations. States in the upper and lower basins of the river submitted proposals to the federal government for how they ought to manage the river. It's no surprise they're not on the same page. But the man tasked with negotiating Utah's interests on the river tells me they're going to keep talking. What we submitted now wasn't, isn't the final deal. If the states don't come up with their own agreement, the feds may do it for them. No one seems to want that. In Las Vegas last year, lower basin states like California struck a deal to reduce their take from the river. We are extremely um, pleased with, with the lower division state's willingness to do that. What about the upper division? What have you offered? Well, that's a great question, Ben. And, and what we've offered is what has been happening over the last 20 years. We would have used more water had the physical water been there. Utah is also offering to stay at its levels and allow more water to go into Lake Powell, but it doesn't want it siphoned by states downstream. I just want them to continue talking and having those hard discussions. Communities like St. George are directly impacted by these negotiations. The Virgin River is a tributary of the Colorado River. The head of the local water district says Utah is living within its means. What I would like is Utah to have the ability to use their water how they want to use it. And so right now, we have a lot of states that want to come and tell us how to use our water. The state-based solution is better than a federal solution. Ed Andercheck is the head of the environmental group Conserve Southwest Utah. He says everyone needs to make concessions. There's less water in the Colorado River, 20% less since the turn of the century, and with climate change and uh, aridification in the West, the projections are that it's going to drop another 10 or 15% by 2050. There may be things that we will not be able to agree to, and reclamation could be in a position to have to split the baby in half, if you will, make some kind of a decision. However, we believe, I still believe, that we can come to terms on many things. So here's what happens next. The states have submitted their plans. The U.S. Bureau of Reclamation will issue an environmental impact statement later this year. A new compact has to be reached by 2026. In St. George, Ben Winslow, Fox 13 News, Utah. Coming up, Weber State University is knocking down barriers to higher education. How a new program makes certificates and degrees more accessible for Spanish-speaking students. Jazz played against the best team in the West tonight at Oklahoma City. Could they keep up with the Thunder? And the Cougars had their dancing shoes on. BYU had their final practice today before playing in the NCAA tournament tomorrow. We'll hear from the Cougars coming up in sports. just going to lead to a lot of more opportunities for the Spanish-speaking community and I'll elevate the community in general. I'm Fox 13 News reporter Mike Lee be here at Weber State University where a new program launching soon would give students the chance to get an education in Spanish and be a part of Utah's growing economy. This is one of the first programs of its kind in the nation and it's the very first kind in Utah. The program that soft launches this fall will offer certificates and degrees taught entirely in Spanish. A handful of classes will start in the fall, but the goal is to have full degree programs up and running in the next five years. What we're seeing in Utah is a greater and greater population of Hispanic and Latinos. So Utah's Hispanic and Latino population sits at about 15%, but here in Ogden, it's actually 30%. So what we're seeing is a lot of those people, their first and primary language is Spanish. So we see an access point here. We see an opportunity to get more people into college who may not have ever done that before. This program is made possible by a two and a half million dollar grant from the Utah Governor's Office of Economic Opportunity. They shared a statement with us saying, quote, Weber State University is poised to provide critical upskilling opportunities to an important segment of Utah's workforce. This innovative program reflects the private sector's goals of attracting and developing top talent from Utah and from around the globe. I'm really excited about this program because it is opening up a whole workforce and talent pipeline 
um, of Spanish speakers and um, new Americans, immigrants, new Utahns, right? Erica Gonzalez is a native Spanish speaker and student at Weber State. She says programs like these help Spanish speakers open doors they might have once thought were not even for them. It's extremely helpful. I feel like a lot of times um, Spanish speakers don't really go for these opportunities because of the language barrier. So having an option that helps bridge that barrier because not only does it teach the classes in Spanish, it also teaches them English um, through the ESL courses. Claudia Loiza is the board chair of the Utah Somos Foundation, which is affiliated with the Utah Hispanic Chamber. She says this program helps upskill the talents that Spanish speakers bring with them from their home country. I, I just think it's important that we don't forget the folks that are behind the counter, that are behind our, our service industries, and really in a lot of ways um, are, are creating that beating heart around what makes Utah so wonderful. The program will be entirely online to try to make learning more accessible. Weber State University is still figuring out which courses they want to offer this way, but say they want to pick subjects that would fill gaps in the state's workforce. At Weber State University, I am Maitli Gubi, Fox 13 News, Utah. Well, did you enjoy today? It was 68 degrees here in Salt Lake, our hottest day so far this year. Tomorrow will be in the mid 60s for a high, probably not as warm as today. But right now, as you get ready for bed, temperatures in the 50s for most of the Wasatch Trent, mid 40s for Tuila right now. Over towards Vernal and Price, 46 right now, 50 for Cedar, and 64 degrees currently in St. George. Here's what I'm watching for you. Really nice conditions for the most part for a couple more days. We are going to see the chance for some isolated showers as we wrap up this week, and then we have a strong cold front moving through likely Saturday afternoon. Ahead of that, wind picks up. West deserts likely we're going to see our breeziest conditions. Snow levels will start about 7,000 or 7,500 feet, and those will be dropping to about 5,000 feet and perhaps a wintry mix or snow mixing in here in the valley is kind of on and off as active weather will be continuing into next week. We had a few clouds today, mostly across southern Utah, a few areas of light precipitation down towards the four corners. We head into tonight. Clouds start moving in. Temperatures in the 30s and 40s tomorrow morning. Rather mild for many of you along the Wasatch Front first thing tomorrow morning with temperatures into the mid 60s for the Wasatch Front. We will see potentially some isolated showers as the week cold front moves through tomorrow, but the bigger, stronger cold front that we're tracking will be on Saturday afternoon. That's the latest timing, at least as we get a little more confident. We'll bring you those details over the next couple of days, but that's when we're going to see our heaviest precipitation this weekend. So by Saturday evening, Saturday night into Sunday, we're still going to see potentially areas of scattered showers as we wrap up the weekend, and then we'll continue with some on and off chances into next week. That was for Ogden. For Provo, your chance of precipitation again really high late in the day Saturday into Saturday night. By Sunday, scattered showers on and off through next week with much cooler temperatures. And for St. George, breezy on Saturday, isolated showers on Saturday. By Sunday, some widely scattered showers are possible. As we look at the next seven days, a lot of precipitation in the southeast and also for the Sierra Nevada. But for us here in Utah, everything in green over the course of the next seven days is less than half of an inch of precipitation. As we zoom in to northern Utah, I do want to mention that the Cottonwood Canyons, the central Wasatch Mountains could see closer to an inch and a half to two inches of, pre of precipitation. Uh, that would be the equivalent with snow melt. So we're looking at potentially six to 12 inches of snow Saturday evening into Sunday, and then perhaps more chances for snow into next week. So March came in like a line. It's going to go out like a line, especially for the mountains here across Utah. For us here in the valleys, less than half of an inch of precipitation expected this weekend, uh, mostly rain but we could even see some snow mixing in here in the valleys. For St. George, 74 tomorrow, 76 Friday. By Sunday, 58 degrees for Salt Lake. A high of only 50 degrees on Sunday. 40s next Monday, Tuesday with on and off chances for rain and snow starting Saturday afternoon. All right, thanks, Allison. Before we get to some local sports stories, here's a big national one. Baseball superstar Shohei Otani has fired his longtime interpreter after he says he stole from him. The Los Angeles Times reports Otani's attorneys say his former interpreter stole millions of dollars to place bets with a bookie. They describe it as a massive theft. Otani is the two-time American League MVP. He's in the first year of a 10-year deal with the Dodgers. That contract is worth $700 million. Otani's lawyers say the theft has been reported to authorities.
Uh, the big dance is here for BYU. The Cougars play in the second game of the NCAA tournament at 10.40 tomorrow morning against Duquesne in Omaha, Nebraska. The Cougars were on the court in Omaha this morning. This is the Cougars' first trip to the big dance since 2021 when it was played under COVID restrictions. So it's brand new experience for most of the players after a great first season in the tough Big 12 Conference. We worked so hard this whole season, this whole off season, um, to put ourselves in a really good spot. And so now that we're here, it's like we did all that work, but now we're here and it's time to, to really show out. You got to be on your A game to win in this tournament. We believe we're prepared. We trust in one another. And if we lean into what we know makes our team special, we believe that will be good for, for the game. I think our guys are loose. I think they're uh, full of energy. Certainly, they're going to feel uh, all of the juice that comes with playing in this tournament. But I think they, they're pretty par prepared to deal with those emotions. And I think we're just uh, so eager to kind of race out and kind of jump in the fray of this tournament and see what we can do. I, I feel like our guys are in a good spot. The Utah Jazz played tonight in Oklahoma City. The Thunder had the best record in the Western Conference. They jumped out to a 22 to 11 lead with this dunk from Jalen Williams. The Jazz starters struggled early, but the bench picked them up, led by Colin Sexton. Puts it up and scores, plus one. He led the Jazz with 25 points. Remember this guy, Gordon Hayward for three. Former Jazz All-Star now with the Thunder. The Jazz played well in the second quarter. Johnny Juzang with the three, one day after scoring 31 points for the Stars in the G League. Then it's Taylor Hendricks, the rookie, knocks down the three. He had 12 points, and the Jazz led it by one at the half. They continue to stick around in this third. John Collins with the jam. He scored 16 points after getting knocked out of the last game. And here comes the Thunder, though. Chet Holmgren throws it down over Hendricks. Big time slam by Holmgren, who led the Thunder with 35 points. And yeah, his teammates were loving it. Then it's Shea Gilders Alexander, money from long range. He scored 31 points, put the Thunder up by seven. Jazz will continue to fight. Sexton to Walker Kessler at the rim. The Jazz trailed by two going into the fourth quarter, but they ran out of steam. It's Holmgren once again. Oklahoma City won at 119-107. The Jazz have lost three in a row, 14 of their last 17 games. We'll be right back. Thanks for being part of Fox 13 News at 9. Stick around for Quick Cast. It's up next.